Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Panos Papadopoulos, chair of the Berkeley Division of the Academic Senate this year. It's a wonderful pleasure to welcome everyone to this commemorative event. This is the day 50 years ago when the Senate deliberated on a motion that uh, set its position on the free speech movement and in many ways signified also the end of a very tumultuous semester on our campus. So 50 years later, we're here to um, commemorate, but also to think ahead um, about issues um, pertaining to free speech. So here's how the event will go. Uh, we have a 17-minute video that will be shown in a moment. <clears throat> the video attempts to um, recreate the most salient parts of the 1964 Senate meeting. We have the audio of that event. Um, it's available, in fact, online. But um, we tried to create a video presentation with several of the speakers, the motion, the um, um, sort of a substitute motion that was put in place. And with that, we will hopefully get a, a sampling of uh, what transpired uh, during that day. After the video is over, and it's, as I said, a relatively short video, and it is captioned, uh, we will have a panel with um, three veterans of the free speech movement and also three of our most distinguished colleagues, and we will converse on the impact of the free speech movement on our campus and on challenges related to um, free speech. We have budgeted for a 40-minute question and answer session, which we hope to have at the end of this event. There is a little um, free speech movement related issue here. There may be a protest that would potentially disrupt this event. Uh, um, the best we know is that at five o'clock there is a group of students and non-students that will get together um, at the south end of campus and they may or may not choose to come to Wheeler Hall. We are in conversations with um, the police as much as you may or may not like that, but um, we know what is going on. We will have ample information if for whatever reason the event may need to finish before time, but I certainly hope that we will be able to go all the way to around um, five o'clock. There is an email that was sent this morning, this afternoon by campus um, uh, recommending that uh, people leave campus by 4.30, but I, I had a conversation a few moments ago and it is only a general recommendation. There is nothing known about what will happen at 4.30 and we will be monitoring this very carefully and we will not put anybody's um, safety beyond this event, above this event. Um, beyond, below this event. Anyway, so I would like to start with the video um, and please enjoy. The Committee on Academic Freedom laid its plans for a deliberate consideration of the long-range problem of developing a coherent philosophy to serve as a guide for a policy that would encourage the responsible exercise of maximum political freedom on the Berkeley campus. The succession of events that have occurred during the past three weeks, however, have given this issue an urgency which called the original plan of operation that had been adopted by the committee into question. Under the circumstances, the committee believes that it has a responsibility to pre present the substance of the propositions that make up the major part of its report at this time with certain questions of elaboration and implementation to be dealt with at a later date. With this in mind, we propose the following motion. <clears throat> there is a brief preamble. In order to end the present crisis, to establish the confidence and trust essential to the restoration of normal university life, and to create a campus environment that encourages students to exercise free and responsible citizenship in the university and in the community at large, the Committee on Academic Freedom of the Berkeley Division of the Academic Senate moves the following propositions. 
One, that there shall be no university disciplinary measures against members or organizations of the university community for activities prior to December 8th connected with the current controversy over political speech and activity. Two, that the time, place, and manner of conducting political activity on the campus shall be subject to reasonable regulation to prevent interference with the normal functions of the university. That the regulations now in effect for this purpose shall remain in effect provisionally pending a future report of the Committee on Academic Freedom concerning the minimal regulations necessary. That the content of speech or advocacy, this is section three, pardon me, that the content of speech or advocacy should not be restricted by the university. Off-campus student political activities shall not be subject to university regulation. On-campus advocacy or organi organization of such activities shall be subject only to such limitations as may be imposed <coughs> under Section 2. Four, that future disciplinary measures in the area of political activity shall be determined by a committee appointed by and responsible to the Berkeley Division of the Academic <coughs> Senate. Five, that the division urge the adoption of the following of the foregoing policies and call on all members of the university to, uh, community to join with the faculty in its efforts to restore the university to its normal functions. Mr. Chairman, I so move. You, you've heard the motion. Is there a second? Like Professor Tussman? I'm Joseph Tussman. I am the chairman of the Department of Are Philosophy. You? Are you making a second? Making a second. Thank you. And one of the working committee of five chairmen, which acted recently on behalf of all the chairmen on the Berkeley campus. I wish to second the motion which the Committee on Academic Freedom has placed before us. The crisis through which we are passing involves at least three sets of problems. First, there are problems resulting from recent attempts to resolve what is essentially a moral and spiritual crisis by the use of radically inappropriate means. The attempt to deal coercively and punitively with problems of mind and spirit. In this field, we may hope, I believe, that the spirit of amnesty will now prevail. Second, there are problems arising out of the quality and scope of university regulations governing speech, assembly, and political or social action by members of the academic community. And third, there are problems arising from fundamental defects in the living constitution of the university, in the relations between students, faculty, and administration, in the general structure of authority. Permanent peace and health will not be easily attained, but the propositions before us are a good beginning. I think they are all necessary. Yes, Professor McCloskey, will you come forward so that you can be heard? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I am one of the drafters and sponsors of the original resolution, which was submitted to the Committee on Academic Freedom for their consideration, and which now, in slightly revised form, is before the Senate for its consideration. We believe that its adoption will bring us closer, perhaps safely, through to a solution. No conflict of these proportions could take place without generating feelings of bitterness and disappointment, the desire to punish or to vindicate. But the time for recriminations, I think, has passed. It no longer matters where the major fault lies, who is right and who is wrong, or whether the greatest sins have been committed by the students, the administration, or the faculty. What matters now is how, by what means, we can survive. It is my hope, and I think I speak for all those who have worked to develop this resolution in its original form, that we can now put aside our differences and that we can all manage students, faculty, university officials, and regents to strike an attitude of generosity and magnanimity so that the damage might be repaired and so that we can all return to work. It is in this spirit, Mr. Chairman, that I wish to second the motion for the adoption of this resolution. My name is Foyer 
departments of philosophy and social science. The other one? Pardon. And I am introducing an amendment and speaking in defense of this amendment. The amendment is to paragraph three of the proposed motion. First line of paragraph three, to alter it as follows, that the content of speech or ad advocacy on this campus provided that it is directed to no immediate act of force or violence should not be restricted by the university. And then in the last line of paragraph three, to alter as may be imposed under section two to as have been heretofore stated. I should like to explain why I have moved this amendment. It does not strike at the philosophy of the free speech movement as I understand that philosophy as it has been expounded by some of its proponents. Insofar as the free speech movement is sincerely committed to nonviolence, it has nothing to fear from this amendment which is aimed to keep from university, from advocacy on university premises and grounds, those who are advocating the immediate commitment of acts of force and violence. The particular resolution which we will enact will probably become a model for many of the universities from here to the East Coast and including the state of Mississippi. As this resolution stands now without an amendment, it would allow a student Ku Klux Klan chapter to organize itself on campuses to carry on meetings at which they would advocate, plan, and organize actions for defacing Jewish synagogues, Negro and Catholic churches, and they would claim the protection of the university sanctuary for these acts of speech, advocacy, and organization. Unless we have a provision, some amendment, which will make it clear that we do not condone this sort of action or behavior, we are opening the way for every extremist and crackpot organization which can then enter upon this campus, advocate its most immediate measures, without fear of any action on the part of the university. Professor Tenbrock. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> on behalf of the Committee on Academic Freedom, <clears throat> I should like to express our opposition to this proposed amendment. We should be concerned with the intellectual and spiritual task of running a university where anybody can say what it, whatever is on his mind and other, and other people can listen to him and think about it and make up their minds whether they agree or not. This resolution is not just a declaration of principle, this, this proposal that uh, Dr. Foyer is making. It opens up to university regulation, what we are here saying should not be regulated by the university in any manner, shape, or form. What other people do by way of regulation belongs to their jurisdiction and not to ours. So the Committee on Academic Freedom is opposed to this amendment to our resolutions. I'm going to recognize Professor Carl Landauer. Carl Landauer Economics. I would like to support the FOIA amendment, the uh, position that we can permit the organization of any lawless action on the campus. That is, the campus organization of any lawless action in the community uh, is, in uh, my opinion, tenable only if at the same time we recognize the moral right, I'm not talking about legal rights, but the moral right of the police to come to our campus and suppress this activity. This moral right I'm not willing to concede uh, to uh, the general law enforcement agencies. Professor Chamberlain. 
Mr. Chairman, I wish to speak against the amendment. I feel that many of the, of the actions that our students would be most proud of might uh, run into difficulty with the, with the FOIA amendment. I regard the occupation of Sproul Hall as a use of force, but not a use of violence. I suggest that the amendment is not proper as formulated. I suggest that we reject it. I recognize Professor Selznick. Philip Selznick, Professor of Sociology. We are not in the business here of regulating speech. That is to say, the content of speech. Our problem is to find a policy that is tenable, that can be defended, that can be implemented, that can find its way into a series of regulations and uh, governing provisions that we can all live with and that are proper to a university. The university has all the resources it needs to deal with disorderly behavior on this campus. It can deal with disorderly behavior by invoking its own rules. It can deal with disorderly behavior by invoking the rules of a civil authority. It retains the right to file charges against anyone who breaks the law. Our problem is not the control of acts, but of speech. And we are moving here. I sincerely hope we shall, we shall conclude here a movement toward a policy that protects the content of speech and that assumes the risks of that protection. We want to invoke the new policy, the policy we should have had all along, the policy we are adopting not out of concession to pressure, not out of submission to outside forces, but because I think at long last we are ready to adopt a policy that should have been with us through all these times. We adopt this policy not only because it is consistent with the Constitution of the United States, we adopt this policy because it is the most fitting policy for a great university. I sincerely hope that we will vote down the FOIA amendment and give our full support to the Committee on Academic Freedom. All right. I recognize this gentleman here. Charles Zemack, Physics. Let no one believe that questions of law and order and discipline are being solved by the motion before us. We are changing the battlefield. The terrain of the new battlefield will also be difficult. Now then, there is something very fine and noble about a community like this going forth to take on responsibilities, not haggling about whether one is forced to do so or whether the responsibilities might be left on someone else. There will also be something comforting about being able to look back on one's work and being able to say, I did my duty, I did my best. Finally, there is the hope, and much depends on this, that students who love the university will be able to find something final about this measure. In the spirit of these sentiments, I shall vote wholeheartedly for this motion. But let's not kid ourselves that the future is all peaches and cream. I'm going to now put that main motion so that everyone can, without any question, know that a vote was taken on it. That is the motion which is now unamended by the, uh, presented by Professor Garbarino, Chairman of the Academic Freedom Committee. I ask that those all in favor of the motion please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Contrary, no. no. The motion is carried. If there is a call for a division, we will have a count. All right, well, you heard the call. The secretary, please announce the vote. 
Mr. Chairman, the vote is 824 I, 115 nay. I would like to uh, very briefly thank the Vice Chancellor for Undergraduate Studies, Kathy Kosland, and um, the staff at ETS for helping us to put together this, uh, this video. Uh, I would say on a personal note that it was very difficult to distill a very long meeting into 17 minutes, and all the people that we omitted, I can take full responsibility. So the, the next um, portion of, um, of this um, gathering involves a panel discussion, and I would like to uh, introduce the three panelists. On my extreme right, your extreme left, is Professor Richard Buxbaum of the School of Law. Uh, next to him is uh, Professor Emeritus, Dick, uh, Richard Buxbaum, Professor Emeritus, uh, Peter Dale Scott of the uh, uh, English Department. And to my immediate right, Professor John Searle of the Philosophy Department, and emeritus as of just this year, I believe. Um, I would like to start by asking every one of the um, three panelists to share some thoughts with us on the impact of the FSM on the intellectual life of the university in the past 50 years. And I would like to start with Professor Buxbaum. Well, in a way, I'm the least, um, not so much qualified, but the least engaged to do that, since my original role in this matter was simply that of defense counsel, one of the defense counsel for the free speech movement, and then later, the other two major events that royal the university, the Vietnam War and the affirmative action strike. Uh, so in a way, I have to uh, remind us of Frank Zappa's comment that if you understand the significance of something you engaged in, then you didn't, I'm sorry, yes, then you didn't experience it. And uh, in a way, I'm in the reverse situation. I experienced it, I sure as hell didn't understand the significance of it at the time it was happening. But on the other hand, I've been here another 50 years since then, so even, even unqualified people may have some views. My main view, other than the, the worry that we are bathing in a kind of a nostalgic amniotic fluid here, uh, is that uh, the, not so much that times have changed and that uh, uh, conduct questions, disorderly conduct in, in, in support of some cause have left us, but that on the whole, I think the campus administrations, in the plural everywhere, learned some significant lessons, not only from our first experience, and we were, I'm afraid, the pioneers with the free speech movement, but of course, on, after all of these events. Um, there are two things, I think, that have, that have um, dissipated. Uh, whether they were caused by uh, the free speech movement or not is another matter. One is, of course, the, the range of issues um, has shifted. Uh, free speech is not, uh, I think, frankly, the critical issue uh, of today, although it will always remain a critical issue. The second, which I find more interesting personally, is that there is a great tendency on the part of people in power to be stubborn about recognition that they are on a wrong or unproductive path because that recognition will seem like a concession to pressure. That, I think, is one of the most vicious uh, inhibitions of sound governmental action in any context. You can take that across the board. If we give in to this, we've, the other side will only embolden its demands further. If we give in to this, we're giving in to threats, which is not our job to do. That kind of attitude, uh, I personally feel has uh, not disappeared, but has significantly shrunk. And a more sober, 
maybe, of course, also a more instrumental and manipulative uh, approach to taking care of events of this sort may have taken place. But I do think, on balance, it's an improvement, because that always struck me as a very bad position to rest on. I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Peter? Well, I'd like to begin, first of all, by thanking and congratulating the division of the Academic Senate for having this meeting, and to thank you personally, Panos, for your role in organizing it. And I can save a bit of time by endorsing what Professor Buxbaum has just said, particularly about how difficult it is for people in power to make any move that might look as if they were uh, f being flexible on the matter of what is to them principal. I, my eyes are not good, and I slightly misread the letter that was sent, and I am going to, but it's also very relevant to what I'm going to say later about challenges to free speech today, which I think is the most important part of this program, that to say a bit more about the meeting and the speeches that you just saw in the video. Uh, and I have some written remarks here. A public university is sometimes torn between two competing realms of responsibility, between the realm of the society which it serves and is supported by, and also the realm of intellectual freedom and innovation. Sometimes a university is forced to make painful choices between needs for social order and needs for social change. The debate we just listened to dealt with this dilemma. The choice presented was between a motion which would grant students freedom of speech regulated only as to time, place, and manner versus the so-called Foyer Amendment with a proviso that student speech should be unrestricted, quote, provided that it is directed to no immediate act of force or violence, close quote. The debate was conducted and resolved in a dignified and principled manner. It was resolved, I think, because a majority agreed with Professor Selznick that unqualified freed speech was a policy not only consistent with the Constitution of the United States, but the most fitting policy for a great university. The debate was memorable, but it was not entirely candid. One might say it was conducted partly in code. Professor Foyer, who moved the amendment, may have been sincere in recalling, quote, the kind of situation which helped destroy freedom and democracy in the universities of Central Europe in the 30s, close quote. But the acts of force whose advocacy had given rise to the free speech crisis and the barely mentioned free speech movement or of a totally different kind. They were directed against racial discrimination, above all the hiring practices of powerful local employers. One of these employers was former Senator William Noland, whose Oakland Tribune was being picketed for his Jim Crow hiring by picket lines composed largely of Berkeley students. Some students were also beginning to protest the US presence in Vietnam and the draft that oblige, obliged young men to fight there. The crackdown on student organizing tables in September that led to the crisis was probably precipitated by a phone call from Senator Noland or a Tribune reporter, historians are not sure which, to someone in the campus administration possibly Chancellor Strong himself. What is certain is that the Foyer Amendment would have codified the Strong Administration's unbending position in negotiations with the FSM, whose breakdown had led to mass student arrests on December 3rd and eventually the Senate debate we have just heard. Professor McCloskey mentioned that the Academic Freedom Committee's motion grew out of a draft approved one night earlier by the so-called Committee of 200. That draft, in turn, had been prepared with great care by a much smaller committee of seven or eight. Uh, one of these was John Searle, sitting next to me, and another was history professor Charles Sellers, who I believe is here. Char Charlie, would you stand up and let people see you? 
They, this committee had met for weeks in Charlie Seller's office, and so I think it's appropriate we should recognize him tonight, this afternoon. Uh, is there anyone else here from that committee? Well, I am spirit. <laughs> John Searle, who will soon speak, was one committee member and a strong believer in campus free speech as an end in itself. But for professors Sellers and Stamp, the issue of student freedom to speak was inseparable from their right to organize for the civil rights movement, even when confrontational civil rights protests students advocated, such as those at the Sheraton Hotel in San Francisco, could be characterized by some as, quote, acts of force. The FSM represented a broad coalition of students ranging from Maoists to the campus Republicans, whose tables had also been banned. But at its heart were two students, Jack Weinberg and Mario Savio, had, who had devoted their lives to nonviolent confrontational tactics in fighting discrimination, both in the South and in the Bay Area. Now, the combined student-faculty victory in establishing free speech on the Berkeley campus helped define the character of life at Berkeley for the next decade and longer. It was also an iconic moment in defining the 1960s themselves, as campus after campus saw similar student movements, especially after the rapid escalation in 1965 of the Vietnam War. I think it is in great part to the resolution we celebrate today that the ensuing protests at Berkeley through two decades of national turmoil were relatively nonviolent, at least compared to Columbia, Wisconsin, or Kent State. Education at Berkeley was made more flexible by changes adopted in response to the FSM protests. Among other things, it became easier for students to develop interdisciplinary programs and individual majors, and for faculty to develop new courses and programs. One such new program seems to have become permanent, peace and conflict studies, teaching nonviolence and conflict resolution in an era which needs such teaching badly. Will we ever see such exercise of student freedom again in this age of plutocracy, high fees, and student debt? It is too early to tell. But just as there are times when healthy change requires more order, there are times when healthy order desperately requires more change. 1964 was one of those times. 2014 is another. Thank you. John. OK, well, I'm uh, very grateful to have been invited. And I uh, enjoyed the presentation immensely. Uh, but one thing that was not uh, visible in it, uh, for those of you who are not here, was the tremendous sense of excitement and exaltation and victory. Uh, look around you, every seat was filled in this place, and every uh, speech was listened to with rapt attention, and outside there were literally thousands of students listening to every word on the loudspeakers. And when, when the meeting was over, and we marched out into this union of the students and the faculty outside of, uh, of Wheeler Hall, there was a tremendous sense of victory and exaltation. You know what it must have been like uh, to have lived through the French Revolution because there was a, an enormous sense of possibility. We can, there was a, a, an absurd sense that we can now rewrite the entire history of the university and perhaps the, rewrite the entire history of the United States. This is zero, year zero of the new era. Now, I have to confess, as a philosopher, I had some skeptical doubts about the <laughs> possibilities that were open to us, but I would not wish, I wouldn't have uh, missed that moment for anything. Uh, it was a wonderful and glorious moment. Uh, unfortunately, 
uh, the uh, people who thought of it as year zero, zero and wanted to create a new society and a new university had a rather impoverished theory of social change and indeed of higher education. And that uh, came home to roost in several respects. So with this moment of euphoria, I want to tell you some of the problems that we encountered. Uh, in a sentence, <laughs> Uh, we succeeded uh, too much. Uh, I had been active as a, as a student protest myself, and we got used to being beaten. Of course, you, you, you took a moral stance, but you got used at the end of the day you were going to lose. Well, in 1964, we won. I couldn't believe it, the extent of our victory. But we didn't just win. We totally wiped out the duly constituted authority of a major American university. And so that uh, people didn't know quite what to do with this or what to do with the newfound power. And, it, and I, 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 having I told you about the euphoria, I want to tell you about some unfortunate consequences uh, that ensued. Now, I'm not going to talk about larger history, because we don't really know enough. I, is it true that the free speech movement created the political career of Ronald Reagan? Well, I'm not the guy uh, to settle that. Uh, I, I'm more plausible is that it did end the doctrine of in loco parentis uh, throughout the United States, that the whole conception of the university's relation uh, to, uh, to the, the uh, uh, students, that the university was a substitute parent. Uh, that, I think, came to an end in 1964. But there were some more immediate features of the Berkeley situation that I want to call your attention to, and I just want to mention uh, three of those. One is it gave our students a completely wrong model of how you govern universities, about w what is the upright way to bring around changes in university policy. Uh, it gave us the model that the way you run a university like Berkeley, if you want a policy, is massive student demonstrations, massive rule violations. So when Mario came back from Oxford and found a rule he didn't like, he did not go to the Rules Committee, which had passed the rule to try to get them to change it. And since he was in, one of the people instrumental in creating the Rules Committee, he simply went out and, and organized massive violations of the rule. That's not a way to run a university. Uh, the second uh, thing is it created a very active uh, and uh, intellectually influential subculture in the university whose primary uh, consideration, how shall I say it, was not really intellectual. Now, of course, uh, the uh, uh, American universities have always had lots of subcultures that weren't intellectual, uh, but they were by and large pretty harmless. Uh, but the, but a, a universe, a, a, an active and intellectually vibrant uh, subculture that was not really committed uh, to the primary intellectual values of the university did create serious problems for us later on. And then most importantly, we didn't know this in 1964, but the whole thing became part of a much larger change in student life in the United States. It became part of something known as the radical student movement. And there you cannot overestimate the importance of the war in Vietnam. We had no uh, way of, of, uh, 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 of running the university as a normal institution during the Vietnam War. And those of you who weren't here will find it hard to imagine what a a terrible burden uh, the war in Vietnam uh, placed on uh, American society in general, but on universities in particular. So we had these three uh, obstacles. We had these three fallouts uh, from the revolutionary ecstasy, and they had very unfortunate long-term effects. Thank you very much to all three. So I was hoping to move to the next set of uh, issues, and, and those have to do with challenges that we're facing today, all of them regarding aspects of freedom of speech. And I would like to ask each one of the panelists to, to share some thoughts on, on these future challenges, current and future challenges with us. Dick? I don't know. Uh, I mean, we can look around today and ask. Uh, the, let me start differently. The issues that lead to organized uh, activity, whether they're demonstrations, whether they're violent, whether they're nonviolent, the issues do matter. And the reaction of a larger community, first the campus community, then perhaps the larger uh, social community, does reflect in part their take on the importance of the original issue that causes the disturbance. And I, I do think that we are in the middle of one such lesson today with the issue of police actions in predominantly minority communities. Uh, and you can, you can see the difference, let's say, 
in the way in which an academic community might accept a certain amount of disruption, including a five o'clock entry into Wheeler Hall uh, by those who are still, uh, in a sense, engaged despite the ebbing of larger uh, support in reaction to those terrible events. Uh, you can see in it also the degree of significant splits within a society uh, as to uh, their own belief system. The New York Times Saturday Sunday had this fascinating story of uh, uh, mixed marriages, black, white marriages, were the respective in-laws uh, totally comfortable with the fact of their personal uh, family situation, uh, have diametrically opposed views of the appropriateness of the responses. So I think a large issue for us is, as an ac academic institution, is to reflect on that question and calibrate the question of the amount of reaction to some events to the seriousness of those events and what they say about the sickness, or whatever you want to call it, inside a society. That, that is, I think, today's issue. And I do think, I, I know, of course, we, we, we seem to disagree. Of course, free speech is very important. But I don't see that context that's playing out today you know, uh, uh, on these issues as being primarily a free speech context. Uh, Peter? Our decade, like the 1960s, is becoming a decade of turmoil. The events of the past two days in Berkeley are not anomalous. They are part of a national protest against what Mario Savio, in his famous speech of December 3rd, 50 years ago, called, quote, the machine so odious you've got to make it stop. Times of turbulence present many diverse challenges to freedom of speech. On the one hand, we have seen students repeatedly make it impossible for defenders of controversial causes to be heard on campus, whether those causes be Israel or Holocaust denial or whatever. As Professor Richard Muller has recently written, we are a university, we must relearn how to listen, how to be tolerant of the free, speeches, free speech of others. What he says is true, but I think it's always been true. That's the job of a university, is to bring people up to recognize the need for intellectual discourse. And it is related to the crises we're seeing because the issue really in the 64 debate wasn't speech in an abstract sense, it was advocacy. <clears throat> and advocacy has been relevant at the meet, at the, what happened on Sunday was uh, people meeting in Sproul Hall and deciding to do certain things. And I'm going to say that this is going to be a real challenge, how you, in what respect you recognize the ability to speak freely and also set limits um, uh, in terms of what becomes illegal. There have been challenges, besides with the challenges from the students, there have been challenges to free speech from campus administrators as well. And I will confine my brief remarks to these. Freedom of nonviolent protest is part of freedom of speech and once again, university administrators seem to have trouble understanding this. It was only two years ago during the Occupy Cal movement that a nonviolent protest was met by police violence and by our then chancellor's very debatable statement that linking arms, as students and some faculty had done, quote, is not nonviolent dis civil disobedience, close quote. In the same period on the UC Davis campus, seated nonviolent protesters were doused with pepper spray, and the officer who did this was later judged after an investigation to have, quote, acted appropriately. I have footnotes for those two th events. Um, these problems may be small compared to the policing crisis in the nation, where since the shooting of Malcolm Brown, we have seen an unarmed black killed in Arizona and a 12-year-old boy waving a toy pellet gun killed in Cleveland. But they are central to our 
issues because historically students have provided leadership to protests and today's protests, I believe, unfortunately, are comparatively leaderless students having in the past been deterred. I don't want to focus here on the police behavior. We have here today a society of inordinate and increasing disparity of wealth and income. For many blacks and Hispanics, this can mean double-digit unemployment rates or subsistence jobs, or in many cases, two subsistence jobs in order to stay out of debt. And students face fierce competition for decent jobs. It means little to tell them that they have free speech when they have either scholarships they do not want to lose or rising tuition costs and rising debt. So it is certain that there will be protests and universities will have to deal with them, especially this university. It is no accident that the history of the nationwide and now global Occupy movement is traced back on Wikipedia to the student occupations of buildings on this campus in 2009 to protest budget hikes. Now, I've been retired and off campus for 20 years, so I know virtually nothing about what is being planned to meet this challenge. But it seems obvious to me that once again, the campus is caught up in a national crisis. To deal with this, I think a new faculty resolution is needed on the model of 1964, but a resolution that addresses more directly than the 64 resolution, what constitutes a protected right of protest and what does not. I myself believe that the criterion for campus protest should be nonviolence and very little else. But what is nonviolent protest and does this or does this not include linking arms? These are issues for the campus community on every level to consider. The debate itself, I hope, will help heal the divisions that have recently split the campus so painfully. And the faculty in particular may find itself again playing the role it played in 1964, hammering out a set of rules that both students and administration can comply with. Thank you, Peter. John? Um, well, the uh, FSM, if it had a serious weakness, was a, a philosophical weakness. It did not have a, a coherent theory of higher education. But there was one aspect to it that seems to me absolutely right and something that ought to be encouraged. And I think it may be a counter to what was implied by Peter's talk. And that is that there was to be a, a strict separation uh, between the academic functions of the university and uh, the uh, student's right uh, to uh, protest in a way that didn't interfere with those academic functions. So the students were to be uh, given complete freedom of speech. You can say anything, but you're not allowed to interfere with the operations of the university. And one disquieting feature of some of the events since then is there have been uh, disruptions of the functioning of the university. I mean, uh, uh, the use of, of uh, uh, amplified uh, electronic noise-making uh, devices, uh, loudspeakers inside this building while classes are in pro progress seems to me, and not a, it's not a major catastrophe, but it definitely runs counter to the ideology uh, that we thought we were enacting in 1964. Namely, uh, that uh, uh, students are given complete freedom, but that a time, place, and manner of the exercise of that freedom has to protect the intellectual integrity of the core academic activities of the university. That seems to me exactly right. Now that said, however, I have to say that the big problems we face now are not the problems we faced in 1964. It is hard for any of you, well maybe uh, given the age of the people in this audience, I shouldn't say this, I was gonna say it's hard for you to remember how rich we were in 1964. We just did not have to worry about getting money for the university. I, I worked uh, uh, part-time in the uh, Heinz administration for two years. We never worried about money. Money just kept coming in. Uh, and indeed, one reason I accepted a job in Berkeley is I, I gave up my job in Oxford to come here uh, was I loved the idea of a completely free university where anybody qualified could attend with no tuition. 
Well, those days are gone, and I fear they may be gone for good. But this is a serious uh, problem facing the university. We now have a financial problem uh, that uh, we did not have in 1964, and I think we ought to, that we, that's going to take a lot more focus of our attention. And I don't know the a solution to it, but I think it is essential to Berkeley's uh, preeminence in the world. And I hate this when they say we're the best public university. I came here because it was the best university in the world, and that's what it ought to be, public or private. The idea, uh, I, I, the idea that somehow or other, uh, a, a tax deductible contributions uh, a, entitle you to raise intellectual quality in a way that taxation should not uh, entitle you to raise intellectual quality seems to me a terrible mistake. We ought to be the best university in the world, public or private, and I accept nothing less than that. However, uh, in order to do that, you have to fund it. It should not be an act of public charity to be a professor in this university. Now, of course, uh, all of us know we can make lots more money going elsewhere, but they're uh, all the same. Our salaries should be competitive, and this seems to me a very serious uh, problem. We have to maintain our competitive advantage o over uh, all the people who are trying to uh, raid our faculties. Now, what about the situation with free speech? Well, in a sense, free speech is always uh, under threat because uh, there are always a lot of people who don't like what you say. Uh, and indeed, uh, we did not, in the FSM, achieve uh, free speech. Uh, we uh, got uh, the university uh, uh, administration off of our backs, but there are all sorts of other threats to free speech. You could not invite somebody uh, onto the campus uh, to defend the government's policies uh, uh, during the Vietnam War. There simply was not level, that level of tolerance, and I suppose uh, Oh, yeah, you could, it was very difficult. I know I had to organize some of these things. And they, a couple of times we had people in, but it was not the common thing. You did not have a complete freedom of speech. So uh, anybody could come in and give a, I mean, when we had that guy uh, who was uh, in the cabinet. The, the Secretary of Labor. Yeah, Secretary of Labor, yes. It was an enormous struggle, and we did succeed in giving him an audience. But that was not a uh, sort of. you remember, it was silence. There was yes, no oh, indeed. Silence that was imposed by enormous pressure. It was not a, a, where anybody could come in and say anything. We didn't have that. We did not have an atmosphere where anybody could come in and say anything when somebody was invited to the campus on a special occasion to give a, a speech defending the government's policy that was a huge event. That was not, no casual thing. And what I'm suggesting is any opinion, whatever, racist, anti-racist, fascist, communist, anything ought to be expressible on this campus, and that didn't happen in the late 60s. That was not the case. We could, with enormous difficulty, bring uh, people who held unpopular views, but it was not an easy task, uh, and I lived through uh, those days. So free speech is always under threat, and it's not always university administrations that are threatening it. Uh, and indeed, the, the, the principal, which I said was uh, the one guiding principle of the free speech movement that seems to me perfectly valid, and that is uh, that anybody ought to be able to express anything, any opinion, whatever. Uh, and the only thing is it ought to be restricted in such a way that you don't, the time, place, and manner should not interfere with the core academic functions of the university. Okay, well, um, before we entertain uh, questions, which uh, is coming up, I, I would like to take uh, John to this point, and I'd like to show a short video that was brought to my attention from um, one of our colleagues. Uh, can we show the video, please? In the end, I regret that the free speech movement, I believe, was a failure. We have so much more to do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, before you say yeah, <laughs> let me just say that prior to the free speech movement, we could not organize on campus, we could not have politics on campus. That was not good. But I could invite a Nazi to come and speak, and the Nazi would be listened to politely. And then students would get up, and they would devastate the arguments of the Nazi, and they would win over the audience by the force of their arguments and their presentation. These days, we could not invite a Nazi here. We can't even invite a Republican. <laughs> I am sad that if we Shut wanted down to the invite, microphone. I, I am, I, I am 
They don't believe in free speech. Free speech. They shut down the bike. Keep going. I am ashamed that if we wanted to fight here on campus, the most prominent. invite Condoleezza Rice here, the most prominent black woman, to give a talk because she knows she would be hooted down. I thank you for a demonstration illustrating exactly what I'm talking about. It is a sad day that we have less free speech on the university today than we had on the day I was arrested. Thank you for listening. This, by the way, is, is Professor Richard Muller of the physics department. Uh, he wrote me an email, he's, he's traveling, but he wrote me an email over the weekend saying that he believes he is the only person that was arrested during the free speech movement that ultimately became a Berkeley faculty. So um, anyway, so um, I think I would like to entertain that or sort of to deliberate a little bit on this issue. Uh, Rich indicated that Condoleezza Rice could not come and speak on campus. Condoleezza Rice last uh, summer um, had to decline an invitation to speak in a commencement at Rutgers University. Christine Lagarde, by all accounts, a moderate politically person, chief of the IMF. Many people think of it as a good organization, some don't. Um, also felt compelled to decline an invitation to speak at a commencement at Smith College. And I think even more, more closely to home, our own former chancellor, Bob Bergeno, uh, who was invited to speak and to receive a, a, a honorary degree at Haverford College in Philadelphia, uh, was urged before going to give the speech uh, to apologize for the 2011 events from a number of students of, of the school and uh, in addition also three of the faculty of the school, all three of whom ironically hold PhDs from Berkeley. So what do we think about that? Dick? Well, for me, I, I always bring these things down from black and white or gray principles down to details. What is a university administration going to do in the Condole, uh, I, uh, Richard Mueller's case is a little different. I mean, there you might ask a question, and the tweets afterwards discuss that quite interestingly. Uh, you might ask the question of, uh, was it your show to come in and, and, and crash, right? Uh, the same way as in a classroom, uh, where we're having a, a public debate, let's say in Booth Auditorium, uh, somebody who tries to sort of take over the agenda you have to have a variety of responses to that. I, I flatter myself that I know how to tamp that down, but sometimes it doesn't work. Now, at a larger level, and this is not, I think, the, the example I would use. I would use Condoleezza Rice uh, or Bergen at Haverford, right? Uh, put yourself in the position of the administration, which is told by the police chief or even by locals that they cannot really guarantee that this is going to work. Uh, are you going to put her in the position of being the guinea pig to see whether they were right? You know, should she be uh, induced to come anyway? What kind of policies should the administration have? In other words, it's two totally separate issues. One is the mob action problem. The other is what do you do if you have a reasonable possibility that there would be a mob action problem? Do you, do you sail into it or do you back up? That's an instrumental issue, and I don't find it raising a moral principle. I mean, for the administration, the question of what the, what the mob is doing is a different story. But I think that may not be satisfactory, but you have to live with this. You yeah, have but you, let's, let's take out the issue of safety, and I can appreciate how an administration would not like to put in harm's way a distinguished uh, guest, in fact, anyone for that matter. 
But how about the issue of wh why we have reached the state where speakers of various you know, opinions on different topics are at the situation where they are not feeling safe to go to universities and speak about whatever issue. Well, I'm no historian. I don't know whether it has deteriorated or whether it's always been that way, but just with different issues. Or, you know, th this I need some help on, right? I don't know what, I mean, the, the, the nostalgia of the free speech movement is a dangerous thing if we believe that we always had that kind of free speech. But I don't know this. I'm not purporting to say we didn't. Right. We've just heard uh, <coughs> Professor Muller was saying it used to be wonderful, everybody could speak freely, but you also just heard John Searle say it was terrible, nobody could be heard properly. I think that what actually happened in Berkeley, and particularly in contrast with other universities at the same time, was that very painful semester, which climaxed with 800 people being arrested in Sparrow Hall, was an intensely lived process which really did create a consensus that however you interpreted it, free speech was important and it was a special characteristic of the Berkeley campus. And that is why we, we were sort of back and forth on this. Uh, in the, at the height of the Vietnam War, uh, the Secretary of Labor from, uh, from Johnson's cabinet was invited to come to the, invited to come to the campus to defend the government's position in a debate with Professor Franz Schurman, who was a leading anti-war speaker. It was 8,000 people in the uh, gymnasium, and it was chaired by Reggie Zelnick, who was a friend of the FSM, and we laid out to the students that this was a very special occasion. John is right that it took a lot of work, it was difficult, yeah. but I think it has to be said, it worked. Yeah. Every now and then somebody would heckle, and heckling actually is not itself a violation of free speech. We didn't even allow heckling. It, they, for an hour we listened, well, for half an hour, we listened to the, to the secretary try to defend an in, indefensible position. I mean, it was his speech, I have to say, was a really terrible speech. Um, but it was silent. And, you know, that doesn't mean that we, we had victory. No, when you have something as powerful as a war, which people were being drafted to go to, so you can imagine how powerful the feelings were, it was a continuous battle to do it. And later when I was in peace studies and I invited Professor Muir to come and defend the Reagan administration to a peace studies meeting, heckling started and I had to go like this. And I said, you know, we, we, it's a privilege for us to have Professor Muir here. And the heckling stopped. But again, it was difficult, but it was possible. There were other campuses where it was not possible at all. It's always going to be a struggle. But that's part of education. I think that we, we should welcome that struggle. Yeah, I don't know if Berkeley was better or worse than other places, but there was no question that really uh, uh, offensive minority opinions were not possible as a routine uh, form of expression in the 60s. You simply could not have invited Governor Wallace to come and give a public lecture in, in Berkeley. We did invite this one guy under very special circumstances. Reggie had to make these passionate speeches uh, urging uh, that nobody disrupt it, and I thought Berkeley was commendable, but, but one a good event does not make an atmosphere where all views are uh, open, where you have an absolutely free marketplace of ideas. We didn't have that. We're closer uh, to that now, uh, partly because there aren't issues today that arouse the kind of passions uh, that the war in Vietnam and, and uh, racism, which has taken a completely different form now, racism did then. But we did not get universal free speech after the free speech movement. We got uh, the university administration off our backs. They didn't uh, uh, hassle us in the way that previous administrations had. But we did not create an atmosphere where all views uh, can be heard equally. Now, I think we're closer to that uh, today, but uh, uh, they, the specific question you ask about these uh, people who are invited to give commencement addresses, what the radicals discovered in the, in the uh, 60s uh, was a very important lesson, and that is the university is at its most vulnerable 
on ceremonial occasions, if you have a commencement. Uh, this is why it was extremely stupid of uh, Clark Kerr to stage that absurd event in the Greek theater. It was in asking uh, for disaster because the university is it is most vulnerable when you have a largely ceremonial occasion in a, with a large audience in a, in a, a formal a type setting. Uh, and what the administrators are afraid of, I think, was not physical violence, but somehow or other the, the whole purpose of the occasion, which is, was, these were commencement addresses, uh, the whole purpose will be lost. And I think uh, you have to be careful who you invite to give your commencement addresses, but at the same time, I think it's a scandal uh, that uh, people were in effect, uh, including our own chancellor, were in effect prevented from giving these commencement addresses by the possibility of disruption. Now, again, the commencement's a special thing, uh, and, uh, and indeed university administrators are especially concerned about maintaining a certain sort of decorum. But it is not a credit uh, to the United States that several important commencement speakers had to cancel because of the possibility of protests. Does the audience remember Mike Heyman's inauguration as chancellor? Anybody here? Interesting. It was almost stopped by the constant uh, you know, and very, very unpleasant. Uh, but, you know, it's a public event at the Greek theater. It's a different story. I, I, I wonder if you'd allow uh, a, a related issue, and that's the reaction to what is uh, force and possibly violence. The worst, the worst one I remember was during the, during the Third World Strike era, right, when a group, a small group of armed young blacks at Cornell University entered Willard Strait, right, ousted uh, the people from it and barricaded themselves in. That, now that, there's no issue here whatsoever of free speech, but the cognate is there. That is to say, the big question is, how do you react, right? Or take our, free, our, our affirmative uh, uh, third world strike. Every day for about a month, right, in the, in the fall of 1969, a group of minority students formed a kind of a barricade at the Sproul, at, at the Telegraph Avenue entrance to the camp, I mean, where, where Telegraph comes in, right? And every day then, first a group of, of um, uh, campus folks, often athletes, but not only, would, would try to rush them. That provoked a waterfront brawl. Then the sheriff's deputies were stationed there and came out every day to rock that, right? Now, that free, you could not justify the action as a free speech action. But the question of how the university had to react to it was, to me, the more critical issue. That, that's the point, I think, that one has to keep in mind. To say about that event, that it was very clear that on both sides, both the picketers by the way, who were very largely not students, I believe there were well, people. I had who, 148 defendants among them, and they were all <laughs> students. With oh, okay, two but exceptions. there were there were some who were not students, and they were on both sides. They were armed. They were armed with clubs and some I told picket, picket signs. Picket signs, but picket signs sometimes had nails sticking out of them. Mm, the, well, you know more about the specifics <laughs> than I do, but the the, yeah. the the point, which surely is clear, is. This was not nonviolence. That's, but that's my point. My point is this is not speech. This is going beyond it. This wouldn't be covered by anything. But you still have to face the question of how you live with it, how you resolve it, how you see to it that it doesn't create a, a precedent for further action of that sort, how you live through it. A lot of this is muddling through, frankly. Right. You know, but but when, yeah. if we're facing the, talking about the challenges to free speech, then I think we can put to one side demonstrations which involve picket signs, clubs, whatever they are, which are violent, because we are talking about if you're going to have forms of protests which are nonviolent but also confrontational, and that was the heart of what was happening with the uh, civil rights movement, that's where it becomes very tricky. And I think that the, right across the whole nation, we don't have any consensus on this. I think that there should be a debate of the kind that we had on this campus 50 years ago to get a clearer idea of what is appropriate, what is not appropriate, and that should be debated by students, faculty, 
administration because I think that frankly that what happened in 2011 on this campus and the UC Davis campus, which got worldwide publicity, made the university look very bad. And it's not bad because of what the protesters were doing, but bad because of the administration's response. Well, uh, can I just say a little bit, and um, following along the line that Dick was uh, expressing, uh, the point is you have to make a distinction between the total free expression of ideas and the use of force in political demonstrations. And you may have a complete uh, freedom of ideas that can be expressed, but the use of force, and there are different kinds of force, just blocking people from entering uh, classes is a use of force, and that's the point that yeah. I think where we have to draw yeah. the line. They, they want to repeat the point I made earlier, one valid thing that came out of the, of the free speech movement's philosophy was that the, uh, the fundamental academic purposes of the university have to be protected from everything. They have to be sacrosanct. That means you're not allowed to use force to keep people from getting to class, for example. Allow me one more re-rejoinder on this. That picket line was staged and in advance notice to be a 45 minute line at the lunch hour, right? In other words, it arrived at noon and left about 10 minutes to one every day, right? Had it uh, not been forcibly breached, now I'm not defending this, but my point is that it itself was not the whole story. The second half of that story was the fact that others chose to show their opposition to that line by rushing against it, right? And then these brawls would ensue, right? So what is a administration to do? Should they give this group that hour and say, all right, you've got the hour, stop the others from rushing them, right? Or are they gonna say that's just caving into pressure? And how do you live through the event and try to maintain at the end the life that you've got together. To me, that is the, the, the key. And the, the force issue, in a way, is no, nobody was, now, I will say entering classrooms right, is a problem, but I would also say that most professors have learned to, to, to prevent that, or at least to, to tamp it down. We had a lot of that at the law school, uh, around John Yu, for example. And you learn to tamp it down. You know, you want to say, sorry, this is not going to go. You want to do that, I'm out of here. You know? And it helps. It helps to have some sense about the reaction to these things. So I wanted to, to change slightly the topic and, and ask the panelists, um, how has the free speech movement affected the freedom of speech of our faculty? Are our colleagues more conformist, less conformist, as we have gone from the 60s to today? Well, um, I don't know if you live through political correctness, uh, but one thing that strikes me is that if um, a tenure is to define, uh, to create an incredibly courageous faculty, knowing that they can express any opinion and suffer any opprobrium and nonetheless not be uh, seriously threatened, then uh, tenure has not been a success because uh, I find most of my colleagues extremely timid about uh, holding uh, controversial opinions. Uh, and maybe they will express them to you in private, but uh, it, it, we have not created an academic uh, profession in the United States of courageous and outspoken people. Uh, there are uh, uh, wonderful uh, exceptions. There are wonderful people who, who really do uh, take uh, controversial stands. But during the period of uh, political correctness, you suffered, um, I suffer is a, a too strong a word, but you were penalized in various ways if you held politically incorrect opinions. Any other comments? It's very hard for me to make a comparison because I retired 20 years ago, so I really can't say what the university is right now. But I do think that um, in the wake of 1964, and I think it took some, some real serious head scratching on the level of the budget committee and so on, I think that there was an atmosphere of relative free, again, compared with other universities. I think this was a good place to be if you were, as I was myself, opposed to the Vietnam War. I was able to, as long as I performed my teaching activities and so on, and I don't want to say I had, I had no complaints. I had some complaints, but they were 
relatively minor complaints, and I felt myself very privileged to be here and to be able to say the things I did. Yeah, the problem was people who were enthusiastically in favor of the Vietnam War and who wanted to express those opinions. They, had, uh, 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 they suffered more than you and I did because we were opposed to the war. You, know, you have a point there, but I, I think that uh, in peace and conflict studies, which I helped start, we were trying very hard to level the playing field in that respect, and that's why I had Professor Muir come in and defend the Reagan administration. So I think uh, we have reached the time where we can entertain questions. There are microphones on both uh, aisles, at the fronts of aisles, so that you be heard and also be your comments and questions be preserved for the YouTube video that will inevitably appear. We ask you to um, reach the microphones and, and ask the questions. If you don't mind identifying yourselves first by name and potentially affiliation with the university, that would be wonderful. Let's start from right here. Is this on? Yes. My name is Ed Epstein, and I'm Professor Emeritus of uh, both the Hall School of Business and International and Era Studies, where for five years I chaired the Peace and Conflict uh, Studies major. Um, first of all, thank you for what's been a very, very important aspect of the if you will, the commemoration and celebration of uh, the free speech movement. Uh, John used the word uh, nostalgic. And I would say there is, uh, in a way, a certain romanticism that has gone on with regard to this 50-year event. As I look back here, I was in the very last row as one of the most junior, junior of junior faculty during the days when uh, I saw all these notables speaking and bringing to a vote uh, the resolution. And I remember the euphoria of walking out and the applause and everything. But I'd like to also mention that there were unintended consequences of the free speech movement. Uh, that should be mentioned as part of its, part of its heritage. And what I'm referring to is departments that were pulled asunder, and I think in the social sciences we saw quite a bit of this, in economics, political science, sociology, uh, professors who, if not literally, were virtually at dagger's point, and we lost some of these faculty, very, very prominent faculty. Another unintended consequence had to do with the governance of the Berkeley campus and what occurred with regard to the uh, careers of uh, Clark Kerr and the political consequences with the election of Ronald Reagan. And sure, there were many factors involved, but the climate of the campus as perceived by the electorate, and we just also extend this a little bit to suggest that uh, the 60s were the golden era at first, but some of the antipathy and some of what we see today of the difficulty in the university articulating its needs and its position in the state uh, are maybe a long-term consequence of, of this. And we saw, in terms of the state, uh, what happened with regard to the support of the university. We also saw, and I, th I think this is part of the residue, that Ronald Reagan's ascendance to the presidency used a springboard of the free speech and the dirty speech and other types of speech movements. And I'm not saying this in, in, in the sense of take away the accomplishments of the free speech movement, but to acknowledge and face it straight on that it wasn't uh, unalloyed in terms of its impact on this campus, uh, this university, this state, and national politics. So let's keep some perspective here. Is that, 
Is that something that this group shares? Yes. Yeah, well, I thought we were, uh, that's precisely the perspective that I at least was trying to articulate. <laughs> Let me put it uh, bluntly. A lot of the things that happened were quite vicious. Uh, my wife, who was a, uh, escaped from communists in Czechoslovakia, and she fled across the border at, uh, and, uh, uh, in the evening and, and made it. Uh, and we, we got married in England, and she came to the United States. She was told I would be assassinated when I worked in the administration, when I betrayed the revolution. Uh, now, I didn't take that for a moment, seriously. But uh, Dagmar grew up in Czechoslovakia, and she did take it seriously. And it's... they. Roughly speaking, uh, my experience is uh, the right wing in the United States is too stupid to be worth taking seriously. The left wing is genuinely evil. They are filled with hatred. And this is what emerged in the, in the period after the free speech movement. And I don't minimize that. I think they ought to be given complete freedom of expression and so on. But I don't romanticize the radical movement. It was a vicious movement. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, don't, uh, I don't think anybody in this room looks back on the 1960s as a golden age. It was an age of tremendous turmoil in the country. We had riots, whole cities on fire, and so on. Uh, but John, at the same time, I mean, I don't think you can just point to a whole segment of that thing and say they were evil, as opposed to the others who were stupid. Uh, you had your problems they were with- on both sides. Right. Uh, uh, you had problems with the left. Um, yes, yeah, there were plenty of stupid people and a certain number of evil people all around the board, but you cannot come up with a characterization of the left any more than you can of Jews or blacks or anything else. I was referring to a very small segment. Well, that qualifies it, because that isn't the way I heard it, I have to say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I'm not quite finished. Well, no, I'll let it go for now. I did have some yeah, more to say. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Joel Pollack. I'm from LA. I uh, can write for a conservative news publication, so maybe I'm, I'm stupid and evil. Uh, uh, just actually a, a question it was referred to obliquely, uh, the commencement speaker controversies, people getting uninvited. And I just wondered if the panel had any comment on the controversy about Bill Maher speaking next Saturday here at Berkeley and what people thought about that. Who's Bill Maher? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Exactly. Uh, well, he, he's a... Uh, liberal com comedian who has a show on HBO, and he had some remarks about Islam that some of the Muslim students objected to, and so they w wanted the student body to get him disinvited from speaking at commencement. The but chancellor said, no, he's coming, and, yeah. but and but just... the chancellor did the right thing, right? He is going to speak. Isn't that correct? He, he is going to speak. I yeah. just thought, as a reflection on, on, on the events of 50 years ago, I thought maybe if, yeah. if, if that was something that... that it's certainly something I'm interested in hearing about, if there are any reactions from the panel. These things are always going to be difficult. And the more tension there is in the country and the more resentment people are carrying around, the more difficult they're going to be. I mean, obviously, I, I certainly would say Condoleezza Rice should be able to come to this campus. At the same time, we mustn't forget that Condoleezza Rice was part of an administration that was one of the most perverse administrations that the American, American history has ever seen. Except That's not, for all the others. Right. <laughs> it's not irrelevant. Uh, Professor Langan? Well, I guess I don't have to identify myself except for that I'm evil because I'm a member of the radical left. Um, uh, so actually, I wanted to come back to the issue of commencement as well because um, it struck me that, especially when Professor Cyril was describing the euphoria of year zero, um, and the failure of free speech to come into existence, um, the idea that there would ever be an equal playing field where all voices could be heard seems to me absurdly utopian. And actually to misrepresent the free speech movement, which had to do with the protection of the speech of those with less institutional power, right? Um, and, and so, the question of inviting uh, speakers to campus, uh, to me, ought not to be um, understood strictly as a, a, a matter of free speech, right? Because it's, it's the money, who has the power to invite whom, right? So if, if we had this community in which we could all share in the, the decision on who would come to campus, that might be something where everyone would then feel, okay, my voice has been heard, I was outvoted, let that person come, 
right? So, so, so we're talking about the um, kind of administrative institutional power um, determining which voices get privileged, right? And this, this is especially true with commencement because it's not, I mean, I don't know how many commencement speeches you've been to, these are not matters of intellectual engagement, right? Uh, so, so this is a matter of, of a university honor being bestowed. Uh, and, and so especially with the Bergino, um example, it seems to me important uh, to uh, recall the details of that event. So the communal, you know, a consensual um, community at, at Haverford uh, uh, disagreed, right? But then the people who were protesting did in fact um, agree to do what the chancellor had suggested and wrote a letter to Chancellor Bergenot asking him to apologize for having claimed that uh, linking hands is not nonviolent. He responded that the letter itself was an act of violence. Right? So, so this suggests that he hasn't actually ever understood what people objected to in his initial declaration. Um, okay, so, so that's all for now. Uh, but I, I would like you to um, address the issue of the idea that people who are invited to campus are not invited um, out of a kind of consensus of the community. Well, I don't know that they should be invited out of a consensus of the community, but one thing ought to be clear, and that is there are no forbidden ideas. Uh, there's nobody, or, or no forbidden histories. There's nobody whose uh, history makes them, uh, or whose opinions make them uh, uh, totally uh, inaccessible uh, to uh, our audiences on the campus. And the argument that was just prevented is one we heard a lot in the 60s. Well, the bad guys have so much power, uh, and so it's okay for us to restrict their free speech. That's a very poor argument. Uh, I, there are uh, people who are, uh, the people who are invited to address commencements are likely to be prominent people, uh, but uh, that is not a disqualification for them to express their ideas. Any other? Well, I don't know about other co uh, commencements, but I've, from the law school's point of view, I think the most conservative person in the 54 years I've been there was Peter Ustinov. And I, God knows, I don't know what his political views were, but for the rest, I wouldn't say that the administration uh, had much to do with it. But I'm, I dare say, to be less facetious, that there are schools, I don't think Berkeley is one of them, where there is a kind of a top-down decision of who gets taken, and that can lead in the right or wrong situation to trouble. That's all. Go ahead. My name is Manuel Oliveira, and uh, I'm a visiting professor in the Department of Near Eastern Studies, where I teach Jewish thought. I wrote my questions so, so that I'll, I can be brief. Taking into consideration that the scientific endeavor and discourse is one of the noblest human enterprises, and given the fact that scientific research is more and more being funded by private sources, and corporations with specific agendas, financial, political, or otherwise, how can we guarantee that that discourse and endeavor will continue to be performed in an unrestricted framework of freedom and encumbered by sometimes dehumanizing agendas? I'd like to, <coughs> I was very tempted to bring up the question of what has happened to the funding of the university, that essentially what the state used to give to higher education is now going in support of prisons. And unfortunately, the people who work in prisons are much better organized in Sacramento than the faculty and the people who work for the university. And I think this is very, very, very dangerous. I think what has happened, we're trying to make do by putting our hands out to various private sources. And I, I accept that there is always going to be a certain bias in a university. Uh, the fact that it is supported by the status quo uh, is just the fact you have to live with so that my ideal candidate for a commencement would never be invited to a commencement, and that's just how it's going to be. But if we are putting our hands out for private support, 
you get situations, particularly in development, for example, of drugs and things like that, where patents are shared. Um, it's, it, it, in department after department after department, there are special problems which arise. In the social sciences, um, I, you know, we used to have a wonderful social science library right next to the Doe Library, and now it's the business library, and if you want to go and do some basic work on get to some basic texts in social science, you have to walk up the hill to the business library because they, the business library is getting funds from outside. Surprise, surprise. The English department, on the other hand, is not getting very many funds from outside by comparison. And so a bias is creeping in, I think, to the university, and we should address this directly as related to the question of free speech. So thank you for the question. Any other? Well, I'd like to say a little bit about that. Uh, in philosophy, we never get any money anyway, so I have no personal experience uh, of, uh, of funding affecting my research. You know, the idea, gosh, if only somebody give me a million bucks, uh, I could do some really exciting research. But it would be exactly the same as I do anyway, so nobody's going to give me a million dollars. But there's a factual question, and that is, has the uh, increasing reliance on private sources of funding affected uh, the direction of research. Uh, that's an empirical question. I don't know the answer to that, and we ought to find out. We ought to investigate that. If I may add, that varies enormously across American uh, higher uh, institutes of higher education. I mean, I would put Berkeley, despite some famous arguments, uh, on the better side of that scale than I would lots of other schools I'm acquainted with. Yeah. But that's, again, something one has to get into detail on. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi, everybody. I'm Leon Wafsi, and uh, of course, this brings back a lot of memories. And uh, uh, actually, uh, there are any number of things that go through my mind, but I want to raise one question. I, I associate myself with uh, Dick's remarks that a lot depends on how you react to these problems how you deal with these problems. And you can't deal with them with a simple formula. Or you can't deal with them with the utopian notion that everybody will behave the way you want them to behave. The problem that the university faces is really integrally related with the problem of dissent, which has now become a very important question in the country. How do you deal with it? Dissent doesn't always take the shape that uh, uh, ideally you would outline for it. Some aspects of, defense, of, of uh, dissent become self-destructive. Uh, they're not completely controlled. There is a situation where there is moral outrage, justified moral outrage. And while you defend the right of free speech for people you disagree with, including strongly disagree with, completely disagree with, you can't guarantee that they won't get a response that reflects the outrage of sections of the population that be abused. For example, suppose you had your ideal uh, business and the, the campus invited a member of the Ku Klux Klan and he spoke here. Could you guarantee that there would be no reaction to it. So I, I think the real question is, do you act on the basis of a certain tolerance, a certain use of common sense, uh, an effort to try to encourage constructive dissent, uh, encourage the movements that express consent to gain greater control over how it is expressed, or do you look for some formula? Because look, we've looked for some formula on defense. What's going on right now with regard to Eric Garner and Michael Brown and so on, it would be a disgrace if there were not a moral outrage expressed in the country. And if there is a moral outrage, it isn't going to be completely controlled. So how do you handle it? Well, one way of handling it is to call out the police or to militarize the police. Uh, and it's not that far-fetched. The university was faced with that problem. It was faced with the problem of what do you do when Mario Savio pickets a uh, naval recruiter, uh, as 
you remember, right? Uh, well, I don't know. Uh, I don't have a simple answer to that. But I have the answer that instead of looking for magic rules and formulas, the approach would be to understand the nature of dissent, to encourage it, and to try uh, to deal with it in not a, not a uh, formulaic way, but in a way that respects and appreciates the moral feelings of students especially, they're a young generation. They didn't just get excited in 1964, they're gonna be ex excited in 2014 too. And no university is gonna come up with a magic answer of how to deal with it. But it can give an example by sharing what is justified in the moral outrage, for example, over racism, and trying to deal with the problems of dissent, which are intrinsic to dissent uh, in a country and anywhere where uh, uh, free speech and rights are under attack. How do we encourage dissent? Yes. Yeah. Any thoughts? <coughs> Yeah, I, well, I appreciate what Leon says, but I think we do have to uh, set principles in the university, and the principle ought to be that any opinion, whatever, can be expressed, uh, and you cannot do it in a way that uses a force and violence, particularly a force and violence that uh, uh, affects the operation of the university. That's what we're trying to do. Now, it's true. Uh, you can't always succeed in that. You can't know in advance what sort of forms the protest is going to take, but I think the principles are very clear. Well, uh, I, I was very moved by what Leon was saying about the need to, un, to share in the, the moral. That's what I felt was the limitation of the debate we saw in the, in the video, that uh, people were trying to tiptoe around the fact that the civil rights movement was underlying the protests that were going on. And we, I think there has to be uh, a, a new debate and, is, there's going to be no magic formula, certainly, but when you have a, a, a chancellor, I'm going to say this again, because it's, or even a third time, that a chancellor who says that linking arms is not nonviolence, there has to be a debate about this. We have to get a clearer idea. Now, if the arms had been linked to prevent students from getting into a classroom, then what John Searle would apply, it would be wrong. But if you have students who are surrounding Sproul Hall, um, that's a different situation, it seems to me. And I, it seems to me that there's not very sophisticated thinking going on right now on this campus. And there needs to be more serious thinking than has been given to debate. It, the debate is almost more important than the resolution that comes out of it to try and create a consensus about what is and is not permissible on a campus. I would like to ask that we entertain the last three questions of yeah. the individuals who are yeah. on the, by the microphone already, so go ahead. Okay, my name is Gina, and I'm from Revolution Books in Berkeley, and I am a revolutionary. So my question has to do with the overall framework of taking a side on what is right and what is wrong, because two nights ago, there were hundreds of policemen pushing students down Telegraph Avenue, shooting people with tear gas. There were rubber bullets. And it was a state where they were not allowing people to protest over the outrageous murders of Michael Brown and Eric Gardner. So I don't see it as an abstract question of free speech, but I see it as a question of people taking a stand and taking action when a really outrageous thing happens. So I think it was right that um, people refused, the students refused to allow some of these people to speak at their commencement addresses that we're on the wrong side of history. You know, Condoleezza Rice supported Bush and was part of that administration. I think if Trayvon Martin's killer came and wanted to speak, George Zimmerman, and say that was right, or Darren Wilson wanted to come and say that it was right to kill Michael Brown, which he thinks it's justifies, and said he would do it again, I don't think people like that should be given a free reign to put out their poisonous views. So I, I don't think it's like it's some abstract academic question, but more, I think there's something new coming into being, which is people are just fed up with police murder and police getting away with it, just as one example of what's wrong with this country. 
Do all three. To, uh, what, yeah, do you so take all three like first? Yeah. So when, uh, do you want to take no, all no, three we'll first? No, no, we'll entertain them one by one. Yeah. So any responses? I, have, I mean, I have no particular uh, uh, argument about it, but I don't think it fits into the issues that we're worried about here. The, the, uh, the, the, the moral stand, I think, is a question that can't be tied to the question of the dustbin of history. I mean, the, the, a moral stand is simply a reaction uh, someone has to an injustice. Uh, whether you have that reaction because you come from a deep left position or not, I think is a secondary issue. So for me, it doesn't change the equation of the question, how does one react to a set of events that aren't always peaceful? That's, I'm not going to go further than that. One sentence, and that is, uh, uh, as I understood the speaker, she was saying we should not grant freedom for these poisonous views. That's exactly what I disagree with. I think, however poisonous, you have to allow freedom to express the views. Well, I guess I'm not quite there because uh, we've been using the theoretical example of the Ku Klux Klan right through, but the Ku Klux Klan was not just out to hate people, it was out to kill people. And they did kill people. And I don't see that it would be appropriate to invite the Ku Klux Klan to come here. I gave the example of, uh, I'm going to have trouble remembering his name. He's a weirdo. He's a, he's a crackpot. But he believes that the Holocaust was, didn't happen, or at least didn't happen the way it's being described. And that's a position which I think is absurd. But it's not going to, and it's very offensive. It's, and, it, and in certain places, it would be totally inappropriate for him to have the right to speak. But I think he should have the, had the right to speak to, on this campus. He was not able to. And in the same breath, let me say that people have come to want to defend Israel, and they were not able to do that either. And that is wrong. Those people should be able to come to the campus. Yeah. I want to go to the next step. Anything should be able to be expressed on the campus. Anything, including the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, they, they wanted to kill people, so did the Communist Party. Uh, and in fact, uh, the Communist Party didn't want to kill people? Stalin killed people. Indeed. But we're uh, talking about the American Communist Party? Well, the American Communist Party is not, uh, uh, the actual, uh, if we're going to study the history of this, it turns out that local Communist parties were, by, by and large, heavily influenced by what was happening in Moscow. There's no question about that. We're down that path. We need another session. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's entertain another question. Go ahead. Uh, Rich Ivory from Psychology. And uh, I think um, actually this debate about who you, where you draw the line kind of makes clear that John's position is the one to sort of favor there. Because once we start trying to figure out who's legitimate to invite to speak, you know, then we're down a very slippery slope there. So, you know, people have talked about that there's no formula for this, but maybe we could be a little form more formulaic and, you know, create something like a committee on diverse opinions there that would actually actively seek to bring diverse opinions to campus so that people would gain practice and experience in having to think about uh, how they invite these folks and, 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 and listen to them. That, that's the first point. The, the, the second point is I was really interested in this notion that when the academic senate meeting broke up that day, they went out into Sproul Plaza and the students were listening and were actively involved in it. It seemed like it was a real uh, um, interactive process that involved both the faculty and the students, and, and I hadn't appreciated that until you guys spoke about that. And it seems like that's missing on campus today, right? That you know we talk about free speech, but we really need to think also about who's listening to what our speech is, and maybe we need to have more engagement about the students and the faculty and trying to figure out ways to advocate for common positions. And just to make a quick example of that, it, I'm really struck continuously about this debate about tuition raises, because on one hand, the administration talks about, you know, if we add this, you know, increase the tuition here, we're also going to increase the grants, and students up to 80 or 100,000 aren't going to be paying anything. And then you have the students speaking, and they're talking about, you know, if you raise this tuition, I can't go to the university. And it seems like, again, there's no dialogue between the students and the faculty. And somehow, if we promoted that, that we might have a better end result of our free speech. Let me, let me say something on this latter point. The Senate will do that job in the spring. It's the Senate's job in the spring. Go ahead. No, I'm fine with that, yeah. yeah. Well, I would just say that uh, one of the things that led to faculty resistance in 1964 was 
it, it takes a lot of time to be a, a member of the faculty. You have to teach, you have to get tenure, you, you have to write publications. And a lot of people were just initially wished it would go away. And that was a wrong attitude. The longer you resisted discussing things, the more serious it got until finally it was presented in the lap of the faculty, a, a, an administration that wasn't budging, and a free speech movement that wasn't budging. It would have been better if the faculty had intervened earlier. And that's why I say I hope that we can begin to create some kind of dialogue on this campus earlier and not when it's absolutely too, too late to do anything else. Last question. There may not be time for this, but I was really interested in hearing you reflect on um, the way that um, the life of, say, a Berkeley faculty member has changed. Um, my sense, and I, I've, I've chaired two departments for about seven years, is that no one ever brought up a question of the abridgment of free speech or academic freedom. All the issues have to do with time. Um, and you, you know, there may be reasons for that. Is the Berkeley faculty more apolitical? Are the pressures on faculty members such that um, uh, we don't go to meetings like this? Um, is it that, I mean, I didn't hear a single female speaker uh, at that uh, meeting, right? So were all of the women at home um, creating the time, freeing up the time for the Berkeley faculty to, to be at these meetings? There's a book by Michael Trask that's, that's very interesting called Campsites on the, uh, this aspect of the, the free speech movement. So I, I, there, there's, there seems to be a kind of almost um, otherworldliness to this age, which is very attractive uh, to me, and, and I'm already you know, almost 60, right? Um, but I have not experienced this kind of um, intensity, right, on the Berkeley faculty into, around questions of, of speech or expression. They're all around temporality. Do you mind identifying yourself, please, your name? Um, Eric Neyman, I'm from the Slavic department. Thank company. you. Any comments? There's one thing that should be expressed here, and that is part of the genius of the United States is its ability uh, to take a potentially uh, threatening but successful movements uh, and assimilate them in a way that makes it seem it's what we wanted all along. Uh, many of the people today who tell me how wonderful the free speech movement was are exactly the sort of people who hated it uh, at the time and certainly hated me for supporting it. Uh, but I think uh, this is not, uh, uh, it's easy to deride this as hypocrisy, but I think it's a wonderful flexibility uh, that uh, people who would have hated the FSM now think it's part of our wonderful Cal tradition. Uh, and I, uh, this is a sign of social health. It took the French uh, two centuries to come to terms with a revolution. And many people still have not come to terms with a revolution. In many ways, many of the people who are supporting the FSM today would have hated it at the time. But I think it's very healthy that they feel it uh, important to support it now. Any closing comments, Peter or Dick? On that vein, you know, there were a lot of things that were wrong with the style of the FSM. And poor John, you had to deal with it when you were in that office working for the chancellor. Uh, but there was also a fundamental dignity and decency at its core. They were trying to write this terrible legacy of a flawed U.S. Constitution that in the Declaration said all men are created equal and in the Constitution preserved slavery as an institution. We're still, deal still dealing with that problem and it was people like Mario Savio and Jack Weinberg who were leaders in the area in dealing with that problem. That decency, I think, communicated itself to other people and many people voted uh, 50 years ago today not because they really believed that the resolution had the perfect formula to resolve problems, but they accepted the decency of the people that they knew among their students in the FSM. I yield. Well, I would like to thank our panelists and thank everybody for coming. Thank you. <laughs>